Jo Leute, ihr glaubt mir nicht, was passiert ist. Ich bin einfach off-camera gestorben. <lacht> ähm, ja, ich war kurz AFK und bin wieder ins Game reingetappt und dann ähm, habe ich das so gesehen, Digga. Ich dachte schon, dass der Lide hier war und mich einfach weggesnackt hat und die ganze Base zerlegt. Aber, lucky me, noch bin ich unentdeckt, aber ich sollte echt mal ein paar Fallen hier aufstellen um wenigstens den Versuch einer Sicherheit äh, zu begehen. Ne? Ähm, wenigstens eine Chance <lacht> zu haben, dass <lacht> jemand in der Falle verreckt, anstatt mich hier überlistet ähm, und ich da einen, einen gewissen Zeitpuffer habe. Ähm, naja, aber jedenfalls hat mich ein Slime getötet, weil ich einfach hier rumstand und einfach doof bin. Ich denke immer, ich bin hier sicher, aber hier kommen die ganze Zeit Slimes und andere Mobs, keine Ahnung woher die Zombies kommen, aber Slime spawnen hier halt, ne? das macht schon Sinn, das ist wahrscheinlich ein Slime Junk hier. Ähm, ja, also insofern ist es natürlich ein gefährliches Territorium hier. Und ja, so bin ich gestorben und ich habe dann auf Kamera auch wieder viele Level äh, hier zurückgeholt, bin schon wieder Level 24. Hab ein bisschen dies, hab ein bisschen das gemacht, so ein bisschen rumgechillt und so geht es jetzt hier auch weiter. Ein bisschen rumchillen, dies, das. Wir sind immer noch am Benchmarken vom, vom Server, äh, also beziehungsweise von meinem Laptop, ab wann mein Laptop hier schwach macht. Wir haben jetzt momentan immer noch CPU-Auslastung um 100%. Ähm, und ja, wir haben jetzt ein paar Leute online. Ist jetzt nicht die Welt, aber ja. Also ich würde sagen, wir starten jetzt einfach mal mit dem Video durch. <lacht> äh, und zwar habe ich heute vorbereitet, wieder was von der Linux Foundation, ähm, ein Video mit dem Titel Introduction to Memory, Memory Management in Linux, äh, Video von 2017 mit 40.000 Aufrufen. Ähm, ja, das kann doch sehr interessant werden. Sieht aus, als würde Matt Porter das vortragen. Link zum Video, genauso wie die IP-Adresse zum Server ist natürlich wie meine Beschreibung. Uh, this is an introduction to memory management, and I stress introduction, so if you're an experienced person, you might not get much out of it. Um, this, is the, this is the presentation that back when, when the early adopters uh, of Embedded Linux back in 2000, 2001, were coming in from working on our tosses, I wish I had sat down and put something this, this good together, because These are the things that everybody needed to understand to really grasp their system. All right, um, so just real quick about the original author, Alan Ott. Uh, he couldn't be here, unfortunately, a good friend of mine, and uh, he's a, a veteran at Embedded Linux uh, developer. Um, he's a Linux architect at Softiron. Um, you may have heard they're an ARM server company. Uh, but he put together all this material. Uh, he's a fellow instructor, uh, LF, uh, Uh, training instructor also gives the, the kernel internals class that uh, contains a lot more than this material. Um, so uh, he did a really nice job on the slide deck and uh, uh, trusted me to present it as well. So uh, anyway, uh, just want to give him the kudos for this awesome material. So here we go. Um, also es ist jetzt ein Noob, der eigentlich keine Ahnung von nichts hat, der jetzt den Vortrag macht. Rose. Nee, der wird schon was wissen auch, aber es ist wohl nicht der originale Autor. Schade. Um, 
and, quote, user space or your user application can stop on, say, your real-time executive that you're using to schedule. Um, so examples of these would be um, an 8086, uh, Cortex-M part, ADRs, all these low-end microcontrollers in the old um, pre-MMU uh, uh, processors. <coughs> so let's take a look. Um, so it, it gives us, I know a lot of us uh, are not working on, on x86, but it serves as a ubiquitous example. Uh, if we look at a 32-bit uh, x86 system, right? Um, lots of legacy, obviously, but it is a common ground. Um, we have um, all of these uh, legacy areas and so forth. Um, you have hardware mapped between RAM areas. Um, you can see that uh, your, your PCI uh, physical uh, PCI area memory mapped I/O is all in the high part. Okay, um, so that gives you an idea physically uh, what x86 looks like. Now, um, what's the limitation with um, the single address space? Right, um, you have portable C programs expect that they kind of own the whole thing. Right, they don't. They don't know uh, if you're, you're trying to port several C programs into one space. Uh, you've got to go set the addresses. Uh, this this can live here, and this can live in this segment, so they don't stomp each other. So it's kind of hard to do that. Uh, you've got to have special knowledge of your actual platform. Um, you need to know what your total RAM is, uh, and uh, you need, as I'm saying, you need to separate those processes. So you have to but do all this work. Some you uh, and there's no protection. Right, as we said, rogue oh. programs can stop all over things. Ich hab schon Schiss. So, ich habe echt richtig Schiss vor dem Typen. Wahrscheinlich bisher um, die so größte, it, right? größte um, Bedrohung. This, it's a mapping. It's a virtual mapping. That's the name virtual. So, um, so you map a virtual address, a fake address, um, to that physical address. All right. When we look back at that x86 map, that's all physical world. And if we can just think in virtual addresses, we can have any mapping we want. So we map virtual addresses to physical RAM, but we also map virtual addresses to hardware devices, right? So PCI, CPU RAM, on SOC IP blocks, right? Everything. So what's the advantage, right? Described how in that flat memory model, the single address space, we have a situation where, you know, I got to tell something to run at this address and this address and this address up to n times and um, actually have a nice memory map of where everything lives. It's not portable. Right? So um, when we have virtual memory, right, you have one processor's RAM is inaccessible to the other uh, processor. It's also invisible, right? So you have built-in memory protection. And kernel RAM is not visible to user space directly. Um, the nice thing you have is that memory can be moved. Right? So uh, memory can be uh, visible to different processes, but you have to actually um, uh, set up a mapping for that. And the other nice thing is, rather than in a single address space uh, where you have uh, all the memory sitting there uh, and you have to manually share it and segment it, right? you can now do things like swapping memory out to disk addresses you're dealing with are just virtual. Um, oh, I hear the other thing, uh, uh, my server laptop memory here is mapped that hardware, right, that we talked about, can be mapped mm. into your process address space. Okay? Oh, yes, it is. You need help from yeah. a kernel to do that on behalf of, of user space. Oh, this right. does happen when you just play a video. We can take RAM memory and we can map it into multiple processes. Right? We're going to get into that more, and that's the, the shared um, that would be a case where, like a shared library, right? Where you're mapping it into multiple processes. And finally, with virtual memory, we get the ability to have rewrite, execute permissions placed uh, on those address accesses. All right, so we have two address spaces now, right? We've got the physical addresses we talked about, and we saw that physical memory map of x86, we use an example, and that's, you know, DMA, peripherals, whatever it maps out to in your world, right? Virtual addresses, right? And those are the ones that our actual software uses, right? When we get to our machine code, whatever whatever architecture, that's our load store accesses, right? Uh, out to memory. And those are always using virtual addresses. All right. So um, 
looking at virtual memory, right? We have to do a mapping. This mapping is done in hardware, so there's a piece of hardware that assists with these mappings. Okay. Once we have okay, it mapped, this Essen dauert no schon ein bisschen. Ah, ja, okay. Jetzt haben wir einen Block lag. Okay, we did it. Ja, nicht wirklich. So what magic does this? It's the memory management unit. Okay? And uh, so an MMU sits between the CPU core uh, and the memory. All right? It's often, in a modern architecture, part of the physical CPU itself. If you look oh at my like God. retro things, you'll find that MMU is more than just to be a separate discrete part. Right? And we're interfaced and we're mm. part of that set. Um, uh, sold just like, say, a PMIC uh, is often a... a integral, separate, discrete uh, piece of a, of a uh, architecture. Uh, so, um, the one thing to keep in mind is that the RAM controller uh, is a separate piece. So, if you get an MMU, the DDR controller is going to be a separate IP block, tightly coupled, though. Mm -hmm. uh, and what does an MMU do? Right? Maybe it's my um, what it does is it just does that magic of transparently handling present. of the translation of those load store uh, instructions into physical uh, addresses. Okay, so we map the memory accesses, the virtual uh, addresses to our system RAM, that physical address space we talked about. Right, same thing with the peripheral hardware. It's no different from its point of view. Right, it handles permissions. Okay, so we got permissions of virtual memory and if we have an invalid access to something, it's going to generate an exception. And with that exception, we can go do some interesting things. And we'll talk about that in a bit. Okay, how an MMU works. There's an important piece of the MMU called the TLB, Translation Look Aside Buffer. Okay, and uh, so that's just a uh, hardware buffer um, that has uh, a set of mappings. And those are your virtual to physical mappings. It'll have permissions for that space, okay? And um, there's a there's a granularity in which these mappings are kept, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a moment. And um, the the interesting thing is that you know TL TLB design is uh, very architecture specific, very part specific, performance sensitive, and so you'll see a wide variance in how TLBs are designed, um, how um, uh, mappings are placed in, if it's software done or it's hardware assisted, um, that type of thing, and also uh, capabilities, how many uh, slots they have. All right, so this is a quick little diagram of what a system looks like. If you're having trouble visualizing it where it sits, you see the MMU between the memory controller, right, and the CPU. You see that TLB on the side with some entries. Okay. All right, so as they're saying with that TLB, the MMU takes a look at that buffer, right? Is there already a mapping in there when it accesses a virtual address? And then it can look that up, and if it doesn't, uh, doesn't find one, then it's going to generate the page fault, interrupt the CPU, okay? Now, if the address is in the TLB, but you let's say you're doing a write access, but it's only set for read permission, it's also going to generate an exception. And that will come back into play as we get into how we use those things in Linux. So in Linux, a page fault, right? Uh, so you have a, a CPU exception uh, generated, OK? And um, this happens um, when you access that invalid virtual address. What makes it invalid, right? It's not in the DLB. Okay, um, and you have three cases. So, um, first, virtual address just isn't mapped, okay, for the process that's requesting it. Um, second, you don't have the right permissions, right? And third would be that it's a valid virtual address, but it's currently swapped out. Um, and that one's a, a software condition. So, let's dive into, we're going to 
dive into each of those, but first we're going to get into kernel virtual memory side of things. Okay. Um, so we use virtual addresses both in the kernel and user space. But the way that we use them, how things are mapped are quite a bit different. So uh, in the kernel, um, we use them obviously, uh, and, um, but we have this split in how we treat our virtual addresses. Um, and uh, the upper part uh, of our, of our um, virtual memory map is for the kernel and the lower part for user space. And usually when we teach people about this, it's harder to think with 64-bit addresses, so we go back to 32-bit, and uh, we affectionately call uh, the default spot that it splits between user space and kernel space is C bazillion, that's at that three gig uh, location. That is a default. Um, so this is what it looks like. So you saw that hugely complex physical memory map of uh, uh, x86 32-bit architecture, and lo and behold, here's the virtual memory map. We've got three gig for user space, right? Config page offset controls where that split is set at, right? And so every process gets its own three gigabytes in that system. It has that whole view. So your memory would go back to that single address space. If you had multiple processes, you had to go link them in all these different spots and manage your processes very manually. And in this world, when we link applications, they all end up at the same place, right? And the kernel just has this one gig in our 32-bit case. Okay, so as you said, um, that config page offset controls that. A lot of architectures, um, if you have specific needs, you might uh, fiddle with that a bit. That sometimes happens in, in embedded stuff. Um, and um, the uh, um, on 64-bit, we don't have this situation where there's ever a possible need to do that. Essentially, um, on ARM 64, we're at um, eight bazillion there. Um, x86, 64, the splits at a, at a different location, um, but uh, you know, given RAM sizes and so forth, uh, it's effectively uh, something that's that's not worried about. Uh, in the 32-bit system, um, where that page offset is is uh, uh, has an effect on how we deal with large memory systems, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so uh, there's three kinds of virtual addresses. Uh, in Linux, and uh, LDD um, uh, defines these these best. You can you can look at that, and um, the way the way we define them are, um, and, and some people use some different terminology historically. Um, but uh, in the kernel side, we have kernel logical addresses, kernel, kernel virtual addresses, and then we have those user space virtual addresses. Okay, um, there's another special case, but most people don't speak about them exactly that way, um, either physical or bus addresses. Um, but you can look at LDD3, the link was in there, um, for a little bit more information. So kernel logical addresses, um, that's the what people consider the normal uh, address space um, that they're normally dealing with. What you get back from kmalloc is a, a kernel logical uh, address, okay? They have a fixed uh, uh, offset, okay? And uh, so uh, you see a magic number there that's the config page offset value, um, and that would map to that. Now that, that physical address is specific to one architecture. Um, that could be wherever um, your base of uh, RAM is. And it does get more complicated in, in various other segmented me memory systems, but this is an introduction, so we keep it simple. Uh, so because this is a very simple mapping, um, logical mapping, the conversion is really easy uh, to do. So visually it looks like this, your kernel logical addresses are at page offset. Um, point down, assuming your physical RAM in that physical memory map is, starts at zero, boom, you've got this very simple logical thing. And accordingly, you have a very simple set of macros that can convert when, it, when it's a kernel linear or logical address. Okay. Now, the next thing that, that's interesting, when, when we have a small memory system, right, so we'll, we'll, we'll call them small or large, and this is uh, really uh, specific to our 32-bit example, okay? Um, so less than a gig of RAM, it's technically less than that, really, uh, when, 
when you look at where the split's at. Um, you have those chronological addresses, right, starting at the page offset and then going through the end of memory. So if you had 512 megabytes, okay, then um, you would have C up through D, all boxes, right, would be that chronological area. Um, so it's very simple when you have that small amount of memory, that's where it gets mapped into chronological space, okay. Um, so things that it, it includes in logical space, like we already said, um, uh, allocations with K malloc, um, get free pages, all of the all of those allocators and kernel stacks. Um, and uh, the key thing here is, um, and we haven't talked about how swapping works yet, but logical memory can never be swapped out. Okay. Um, there is. Uh, as we said, there's that fixed mapping. We saw how simple the, mac uh, the macros were for that, okay? But what's, because of that, all everything in that chronological area, it's all physically contiguous. So that's important because we need that for DMA. So that's that's why you'll see uh, k malloc and those, those types of allocations used with DMA-able buffers, okay? Okay, then it gets complicated. If you're on a large memory system, something more than a gig of RAM nominally, right? We run out of space, right? Our page offset was at C, but so how are we going to map that all into kernel? We can't, okay? Uh, so uh, there is, we run out of room there, and then on top of it, we have to have the space for use by vmalloc uh, memory, which is our uh, kernel virtual address range and we need to keep that. So we're going to talk about that in a moment, okay? Um, once we go above that gig of RAM, nominally it's actually less. Um, then we have stuff uh, uh, mapped uh, into the kernel virtual uh, memory area, and so that's the, the high mem support. Again, note that when we're taking the 32-bit model, we have that problem with 64-bit. We don't really effectively have that problem until we're going to get ginormous amounts of RAM on the system. It doesn't seem like it's going to happen tomorrow in that space. Okay. All right. So, chronological mapping, right? We saw page offset. And okay, then in this large hoffen wir mal, dass mein Client hier vor dem Server schlapp macht. Das wäre so dann ein Win eigentlich. Wenn eine Person uh, alleine einen richtig starken Rechner braucht. Okay, so krass ist mein Laptop, den ich spiele auch nicht. Ich nehme nebenbei auch noch auf. Aber das mit einem Kartoffelcomputer alleine nicht den Server in die Knie zählen kann. Aber noch kann ich mich hier frei bewegen von der Frame Rate her. Ich glaube, ich muss das Gehege vergrößern. Oder? Was sagt ihr? Nein, 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 nein. Physical RAM, oh, 
so that that's what that looks like and then you've got your virtual address space up there right your modules are getting installed your IO remaps all of that all right so keep in mind as we said that the key there is it's non-contiguous right you can't 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 rely on it for DMA at all that's the main point here all right that um, Yeah, so this is this is reiterating probably maybe too much um, is, is this emphasis that on the 32-bit machine, right? We have a very constrained space um, in that in the the the, uh, the logical address space if we have um, you know 768 meg of RAM, okay? So there's less space for for kernel virtual addresses. So um, those are tunable, and you just don't deal with this problem on the 64-bit system. All right, so let's jump into the meat of user virtual addresses because this is where it gets more complicated. Um, so our user virtual addresses, right, that's what our applications or our processes are, are, are mapped into, okay? They're all below page offset. If you remember that memory map we saw below uh, the three gig mark in, in our model 32-bit um, uh, system, right? And each process has its own mapping. What I mean by mapping is its own view of virtual address space, right? A thread shares mappings, and things get a little bit more complicated with clone because there's a lot of options, and you can choose how much you're sharing and so forth, uh, but that's beyond intro level. Um, and uh, so one of the key things is um, kernel virtual logical addresses, right? They have that fixed mapping, okay? User processes are fully used in the MF2, and um, the only time uh, the only time that you actually use RAM is when when um, when you're actually touching it. We'll get into that, right? The memory isn't contiguous. It's a lot like that VMALIC space in kernel. You can't rely on anything being contiguous just because it looks that way from the virtual address, right? And um, the nice thing is you can swap out. Remember, kernel logical. Uh, uh, virtual addresses, it's not swappable memory, and uh, the memory um, can be moved around on you. So that's the virtual world. Uh, all right, so um, what, what does this fundamentally mean? Since things can be moved around on you, it can be swapped out, you can't use it for DMA, right? Can't, can't allocate, can't malloc memory and then try to DMA to that virtual address, all right? It's not not going to be a, a stable backing behind it. All right. Now, how does this work? Every process has its own memory map. You can go look at struct mm. Right. There's pointers to that in your task struct for your process, and uh, that's where that whole mapping is kept of those uh, um, pages. We'll talk about pages in a moment. Um, every time you do a context switch, that memory map gets changed, and that's where that overhead comes. Right. Your context switching overhead where you have to go change that map, okay? Um, so again, back to our map here. Um, we've got this, this view of the 32-bit world, and um, every time we change the process, this whole set of mappings in here into the space is gonna change. So back to the MMU, right? Um, so we use that to, to manage those virtual address mappings, and so I already, hinted at page, so how does this done? It works on the granularity of a unit called a page, okay? Um, and some architectures, people always hear 4K. Um, some architectures, most architectures, they're configurable. Um, there's um, some advanced features, some very large page types. Um, we're not gonna get into that um, today, but here's some common ones, right, 4K. Um, 4K or 64K or an ARM 64. Um, like I say, we're not going to talk about huge pages. That would be a more advanced topic, but uh, let's just assume 4K for uh, this talk since that's what most, uh, most architectures are defaulting to. So that's our unit of memory that the MMU can work with, right? Um, we're aligned on that page size anytime we do any allocations or mappings, all right? And then we have this concrete concept which is the page frame, okay? And that's page size, page aligned 
unit of memory of physical memory. So anytime we say page frame, that means in that physical memory map, okay? And when we talk about a page, that's the unit for virtual addressing purposes that the MMU is dealing with, okay? And so you'll see that abbreviation PFN throughout the memory management code. That's your page frame number, right? Referring to that page frame physical unit. Okay, so MMU operates on pages, right? Memory mapper process is gonna have this huge list of mappings, right? Big space, a bunch of scattered page frames all over the place, right? A range of multiple pages. And so what does the TLB need to know, right? The TLB, when, when it actually gets loaded with a mapping, right, a virtual address, a physical address, so page, page frame, right? and then a set of permissions, right? Rewrite, execute. Back to our view of that, right? Just as a reminder. All right. Um, so as we, were, we, we touched on earlier, um, if we ac access a region of memory, right, that we don't have mapped, we're gonna get a page fall exception, okay? And this is normal, right? These are good things. We want this page fall exception, okay? And I mentioned that TLBs vary in size. Some of the embedded stuff, they have 16 entries in it. It's not much when we know that our page size is 4K, right? And so that's got a lot of churn in it, okay? And so when we context switch, we have a lot of page faults as we start touching virtual addresses that aren't mapped, right? So your process gets swapped or context switched in, you start executing code, it's touching, you get page faults, that exception, because we don't have a mapping, right? And um, we also have a, a concept of lazy allocation we'll talk about in detail here. Uh, all right, so this is what it looks like visually. In between, you've got your virtual address. Yeah, ja, also the speed experience leidet langsam schon ein bisschen, muss ich sagen. Those physical page frames, right? Langsam tut's weh, Leute. Aber nur langsam. Page ranges, right? so contiguous Im Server geht es irgendwie schneller. For your, uh, your process, um, some data area that's mapped, and those are going through the TLB to access actual backing page frames for that area. And then you'll have some on map space that maybe hasn't been executed yet. Notice that's the, the allocated frames on that side that's going through there. All right, um, so just just as I mentioned with kernel virtual addresses and that vmalloc space, it's not guaranteed to be contiguous, okay, in, in user space virtual addresses, right? So don't rely on that. We already said that's why you can't use them for DMA. Right? And one of the reasons for that is it, it makes it much easier to allocate memory. You get into how the internal memory allocators uh, work and, and uh, think about how how fragmented things get. This allows you to go put together a large allocation with a lot of scattered page frames, right? And, um, and almost everything you do, it doesn't require physically contiguous um, page frames backing your code. All right, um, so uh, as, as we were saying, when we looked at that, that mm -hmm. virtual address and, it's, and we said, the virtual address space in that three gig area. So one of the cool things was that each process gets its own address space. So what does that mean? You hear that all the time. It means that when you look at the virtual address space, so you look at that task struct and that MM, you're going to see mappings that have that same virtual address, but they're pointing to all different physical memory addresses all over the place. So if they're in there at the same uh, if you have things uh, scheduled uh, running next to each other, they're using the same virtual address, right? They get scheduled in, but it's mapped, right, to a different page frame each time. So, uh, but they don't have to know about that backing. And so, here's an example: process one with this set of, of, of uh, virtual addresses mapped through all these different page frames. Right? In the blue. And then process two has got these same virtual addresses and he's 
is touching completely different page frames, right? Just visually representing that, okay? Um, and now we get into shared memory, right? Uh, we, all, we need to, for IPC purposes, shared memory is a common concept, a POSIX concept, um, normal concept in most OSs. <laughs> and, um, and so uh, <laughs> shared memory using MMU, it had to come. saw how we can have the same virtual address over. with different page frames, right? We can have different virtual addresses going to the same page frames. That's essentially how shared memory works, right? So simply map the same physical frame to different processes, right? The virtual addresses don't have to be the same. And uh, now you have shared memory, right? Two different processes, completely different virtual addresses, but they're touching that same page frame as they get context switched in. Okay. Now how does that look? We've got the shared physical frame down there in green, right? We've got this virtual address mapping to it. It's touching that shared frame, right? This is a 4K shared hmm. memory space. Also bei diesen Video, was wir gerade schauen, bin ich echt ein bisschen lost, Leute, muss ich sagen. And the other process pointing to the same frame. Boom, we've got shared memory. Um, Ibrahim is kein um, Kernel Hacker. Uh, so that was a case with, with different virtual addresses. Okay. Um, unbreak. The MMAP system calling may be familiar with. Right? You can get at a specific uh, um, uh, address uh, to share uh, the memory. So um, that's, uh, that's a different case. Okay. And. Uh, ja, dann nehme ich halt die Unbreaking Schaufel. All right, let's talk about lazy allocation. Um, so, one of the things you will notice when you uh, work on a Linux system or classic Linux system is that um, the kernel's not going to allocate uh, memory uh, directly. Well, yeah, you saw your, your call actually come back successfully, right? You got virtual memory, but it didn't actually allocate the physical memory of those page frames that back it, right? And that's what we call lazy allocation. So this is an optimization, right? The kernel's gonna wait until you actually need to use that memory. So if you're allocating a four megabyte chunk of memory for your database and you haven't touched any yet, it didn't really allocate anything for you, right? If you, if you never use it, you never touch it, it never allocates anything. All right. So, how does this work? Um, so when we, we request that memory, it just creates this record of the request in the page table. We'll talk about page tables in a moment. Returns the process, and so you've got that virtual memory set aside in the user space process. Okay. Also this is Once we touch it, our old friend, the page fault, comes into play, right? Page we already fault. learned that we're going to get an exception, right? Because there's, there's no mapping there, right? Or it's only set to read permissions, right? And uh, we're going to go do a uh, page fault handler. So, um, kernel's going to use page tables, see that the mapping is valid in this case in a lazy allocation, right? Allocated virtual address space, but it's not yet mapped in the TLB, okay? Um, at that point, it's going to allocate those page frames, a page frame, a series of it, whatever the request uh, needs to be satisfied with. Okay, and uh, then it's going to update the TLB, it's architecture specific, how that happens, of course, with that mapping, and then he comes back from the exception handler, the user space program continues, so your malloc got you that virtual address space and returned quickly, but when you went to touch the memory, all of this happened behind the scenes, right? The first time you went to dereference that pointer and update it with a value. So that's what's happening behind the scenes, okay? But you're not aware of that key point here, right? Um, but you will see it if you're running uh, benchmarking and you see that lag, right? Apropos lag, ich würde gerne mal in die Logs schauen. Mm. das irgendwas sagt von Server Overloaded. Ah ja. Ähm, 
Ähm, so. Äh, can't get up, the surface overloaded. Äh, running, was? 14.000 Millisekunden ähm, oder 290 Ticks behind, 400 Ticks behind, 300 Ticks behind. Ich weiß nicht, wie übel es ist. Ähm, Ja. Ja. Ja, keine Ahnung. sensitive uh, things here, right? You know that uh, you have a fast path. Um, you can go uh, pre-allocate that. You may have used MLOC um, or the family MLOC calls. Um, that will go ahead and pre-allocate these things so you don't have that lazy allocation situation. Um, so as we said, getting into page tables, TLB entries could be, the, TL the entries in the TLB can be a limited resource, right? We can't just map the whole world of our address space in there, right? Um, so um, we have a lot more mappings in that struct MM for our process than we have TLB entries. So the kernel's got to track all that. So it has a set of data structures uh, we call the page tables, okay? And uh, you can look at struct MM in the VM area of struct and see how um, those are done. And um, but it's essentially a hierarchy that leads you down to that 4K page, right? And the associated mapping to page frame number and the permissions, right? So everything lines up with what needs to get loaded into the TLBs, okay? It also has metadata in addition to that about is it valid or not and so forth and some other housekeeping uh, um, flags as well, okay? Uh, <coughs> so, um, When we have something in a page table and it's a TLB, we, so we have a valid mapping. Yeah, right? I'm breaking and this you touch it, The hardware, since there's nothing in a TLB yet, is going to generate that page oh, call, right? CPU doesn't have knowledge touch, no? CPU, the MMU, right? Uh, only a kernel does. All right. So our page handler runs, right? It's going to traverse these page tables, find that mapping for the virtual address, right? Page granularity. Select and remove an existing TLB entry, create a new one with our address and the correct permissions and so forth, and come back to the user space process. Okay. All right, swapping. And good. All right. Um, so swapping, we're used to our systems. We, we deal with our desktop systems, our development systems. Um, where uh, we have uh, a lot of swapping out to our disk when they're doing heavy builds, right? I'm running low on RAM. And, um, you know, how this works is uh, the MMU is the thing that enables this, okay? And um, so um, you're going to run out of that 16 gig RAM you have under these heavy builds, and uh, uh, you're going to context switch, and it needs more memory, and it's going to take those page frames that were backed and it's going to take the contents of those 16 gigabyte and push them out RAM beim Bauen okay. and then aufgebraucht. Was denn das für ein Projekt für dich? Wenn du back and you've been context switch back in, it's going to read that back off that slow storage and bring it back in. That's the big picture, right? So low level details, right? It's going to do that on a frame based basis, right? 
It's going to copy a frame to the disk, remove the TLB entry, and then that frame is free to be uh, backed for another process, right? So when we need it again, right, CPU generates page fault, right? Common theme here. We, we flush that entry out of the TLB, right? So now it's going to generate a page fault, and then when we, we hit that page fault, process sleeps, we copy that frame from the disk into an unused frame, and we update that page table entry, and then wake the process back up. Okay? So it's going to be a slow process, right? We've got to go out to that block I.O. We're throttled by that bandwidth now. <clears throat> so when we restore the page to RAM, okay, we're not necessarily getting the same page frame. So again, we have this virtual dance going on here, right? Uh, there is no persistence or affinity to that original physical page frame. So you need to get rid of this notion that page, you know, physical addresses matter. Okay? Uh, you will use the same virtual address, though, right? Because those mappings stay the same in user space. Right? So you don't know the difference. So your code's executing along. You yield the processor. It gets swapped out. You context switch back in. It could, it'll, it'll redo that that mapping. Same Come virtual address, and your code continues on at the same virtual address, but a completely different backing as it, the page frame context gets copied back in and then mapped That's in. Bad. Okay. Again, this is that low-level detail why we said we can't use user space virtual addresses for DMA. We have no persistence of the physical backing that the DMA engines and the peripheral hardware need. All right, so what does this look like visually? Um, we've got a frame that was selected um, by the kernel to be swapped out to our disk. We've got this wonderful trash can looking cylindrical disk thing here. And um, we copy that frame out to the swap media. We invalidate the TLB entry. Page table entry is invalid now, right? Okay, and now there's there's no entry there, so that that frame's freed up. So now you can free it back into the allocator pool, but the the data is preserved out there on disk. That's in your swap partition, right? All right, now we get we get we get context switched back in, right? We're back and running, same process. We try to access that same virtual address we were just running when we got so rudely taken off the CPU, and we get the page fault thing. We've been through the page fault dance before, and we just rock on through that. We get copied from the swap, this cylindrical, simple disk thing, <laughs> and uh, um, put back in, into that page frame that we got allocated. Create the TLB entry. Oops. I thought I had one more animation. Yeah. And uh, then we return to user space. Now we can access that virtual address. We've got the same data we had before we got swapped out. All right, so I'm actually running this on time, yeah, so I win. All right, <laughs> it's 95 slides. <laughs> um, so user space, um, we got several ways. So. So we've been through that whole stack, all the major pieces of how everything's happening in the background. Now, now let's see how this maps into you know our uh, APIs we have in user space. Right? And uh, so we have several ways uh, that we allocate memory. Right? Um, we've got all our yeah, family of right. alloc things, and I've referenced them a couple times verbally. Right? We know that we can M map um, to directly allocate and map pages. We often see that to map some peripheral I.O. Um, if we're hacking around not doing proper kernel drivers. Um, we have break and S-break where we can modify the heap size, right? So first off, M-map, right? One way that we allocate uh, a bunch of memory from user space, right? Um, you'll see it if you, if you live the world of running S-trace on things. You see lots of M-map happening, right? When the files are getting uh, um, uh, opened and so forth. Uh, so if you use Map Anonymous, 
you get you get allocated uh, normal memory. Uh, the shared flag allows us to share that memory with other processes. All right, so break. Why is it called break? So that's the top of the program break, legacy terminology, right? And um, so uh, <coughs> effectively, you increase the heap size with that, as we were saying. Okay. Now, um, lazy allocation. Going back to our whole lazy allocation technique. Okay. Um, we have a situation with with uh, if we look at mmap.c and do break. Um, that it's implemented a lot like MMAP, all right? So it goes in, it modifies page tables. We talked about how that happened, right? Uh, where we modify the page tables, and then we wait for a page fault, okay? And uh, the other thing you can do is you can pre-fault um, what we talked about with uh, MLock, right? And not have that issue where with, with access into memory, you have this long lag relatively long lag where it actually has to allocate that big, big chunk of page frames for you, right? So you can, you can take that cost up front with MLOC and then have uh, relatively deterministic behavior um, once you're actually accessing the memory. Um, the implementations uh, of MALIC and CALIC um, are the same thing. Um, they're going to use break or MMAP depending on how big the allocation is. And that's going to happen behind the scenes, right? And uh, if, you, if you are astute, you can modify that behavior with malopt. Um, you can set the threshold parameter to say where, where one kicks in or not. Um, that's often used in system tuning, okay? And then uh, finally, a stack. Um, if a process goes beyond the stack, right, CPU is also going to trigger a page fault. Okay. One of the special things that the page fall handler does in this case, right, is it's going to detect that you got an address just beyond beyond the stack. It knows where that's at, right, and then it can allocate a new page, right. So it would allocate another PFN, go into the page tables, map that in, drop it in the TLB, and remember, PFN could be anywhere. It's not physically contiguous. It's just virtually contiguous. So gets faulted in, execution continues on, and it's able to, you know, drop stuff on that segment of the stack. Um, you can see how that works and do page fault. That's the ARM version. And um, so, quick summary. Like I said, introduction. So if you're already a kernel expert, you probably know all that. But we went through physical memory, right? We looked at uh, stock um, you know, x86 familiar memory map. We talked about virtual memory, three types, right? Kernel logical, kernel virtual, user virtual. Which ones are contiguous or not, right? We use kernel logical for DMA. Um, we went through user space addressing how uh, processes will not have contiguous uh, physical memory and how swapping page faults work to do lazy allocation and so forth. Um, I guess it would cover swapping and then how those user space uh, APIs map onto all of that. So that's it for the intro. I've got one minute for questions. Nice. Okay, ich habe circa gar nichts mitgenommen, aber vielleicht, äh, wenn man dann noch ein paar mehr Kernel-Videos schaut, irgendwann macht es dann mehr Sinn. Keine yes. Ahnung wie das bei euch ist, aber uh, Fragen sind da. Aber man sieht jetzt den ganzen Saal. Was ein geiler Saal. Ist das eine, eine Oper oder was? Ein Theater? Krass. Sieht echt cool aus da. Sicher geile Stimmung. Nicer Dicer. Okay. So, so first part, first part of the question, let me address that. So, the question was, well, if the kernel always has the mappings, right, and you're talking about that kernelogical mapping that has, why do we have to wait for this expensive mapping to user space? And that, that so to answer that, and I'm, hopefully I'm answering the right question, um, the reason for that is those, those kernel logical mappings, if we just use those, it would be just like that single address system without an MMU. And I can tell you that there's, there's systems that in the 90s that had MMUs that running RTOSs like VXWorks, they would map with the MMU just flat 
address space because they had to have the MU on for performance reasons. But you were you you don't without without having your own process space, right? You would have to link everything in its own address space and everything. So kernel logical addresses are nice and linear and easy to think about, but uh, you have to do these remapping uh, for your user space to have that nice world that we enjoy of that protected per user process address space where you just ich weiß nicht, ist das Client oder Server-Side, dass dieses Dropping nicht mehr so gut klappt? Wahrscheinlich sind das meine Client-FPS, die den Doppelklick verschlucken. Ich weiß nicht, aber irgendwie mit Kisten arbeiten. Hey! Pain, pain, pain. Aber ich denke, wir können noch eine Episode Performance-Testing dranhängen. <lacht> ähm, weil ein bisschen geht noch, Leute. Ein bisschen geht noch. Also das war das Video Introduction to Memory Management in Linux von, oh mein Gott, was für ein Channel war das? Der Linux Foundation, oder? Ja, der Linux Foundation. Ähm, meint, es ist eine gute Idee, jetzt am Ende der Folge noch zu sterben und mit drei FPS in das Loch da unten zu springen. Ich glaube schon. Ähm, <lacht> Ja, dann würde ich sagen, machen wir in der nächsten Folge weiter mit Performance-Testing von einem Server und schauen mal, wie hart wir hier ins Limit gehen können. Ähm, aber für diese äh, Episode des Performance-Testings äh, würde ich mal sagen, war es das. Und dann ähm, sehen wir uns in der nächsten Folge. Äh, nicht vergessen, die Beschreibung abzuchecken für die IP-Adresse von dem Server und natürlich mal einen Klick geben bei der Linux Foundation ähm, für diesen ehrenwerten Content. Ähm, ja, dann haut rein. <lacht>